month, and for the months to come, we're going to be talking about sonship. Remember, at the end of last year, we started speaking about viceroys and the understanding of what that means. And as I said last week, we'd be going to go layer upon layer, upon layer upon layer, so that we can have a thorough understanding of God's purposes in creating mankind on earth. And uh, the understanding of sonship, beyond just the viceroy, the understanding that God created mankind to be his sons in the earth and to carry out his nature is something that the enemy would do everything in his power to destroy your understanding of that reality of God's intentions. As we speak of it in the weeks to come, we'll also understand how the enemy has tried to destroy God's purpose and plan because even though it was in God's heart, it was, it was a mystery hidden in the heart of God until the fullness of time came and Christ was revealed and God's purpose was unfolded. But how the enemy has since the beginning tried for all of humanity, which means you, he's had a very specific purpose in your life and through your history of your parents and your grandparents and Opa Groikis to try and get you not to understand God's intention and purposes and that which God is committed to seeing come about. So committed that he wasn't prepared to even go in an oath with a man who could fail, but that he made that covenant, that oath with himself to say, this is my intended purpose and I will bring it about. And it's so important for us to understand why God did what he did. God puts his spirit in dirt to draw forth a race called the sons of God. And we understand that mankind rejected the nature of God because God was a father to Abram. Abram was a son of God. And through the enemy's lies and deception, Adam gave up that right to be a son of God. And he rejected the very nature of his father in him. And he chose to believe the lie and accept an orphan spirit, which caused him to live with a different nature, a nature which manifested itself in selfishness, in murder, and all the other kinds of characteristics that go with orphan children. He rejected, mankind rejected the nature of God. But God pursued man. Why? Because he swore with an oath that he would bring forth sons. And even though mankind was so deprived, Noah finds grace in the eyes of God. And God says, I'd be tempted to wipe them all out, except I've made an oath. I will bring forth sons out of this. And he finds one man who demonstrates being a son of God. And God says, I'll work with you. I'll, write, I'll wipe the rest out, but I'll start with you and I'll work with you. And then we come to Genesis 14. We find an interesting story. And um, my dad spoke about this yesterday, uh, last week. I thought he was going to preach my whole message. So before we go to that passage, let me just tell you the little bit that, that, um, that my dad told. So Abram became very wealthy, acquired a lot of wealth, and um, he shared much of his wealth with Lot, and Lot was captured by the king of Sodom and five kings together took him captive. And as we heard last week, Abram was so wealthy, he had his own army. 
And he pulled together this army and went in to go and rescue Lot. And as we heard last week, he refused to take anything from the king of Sodom, but he retrieved Lot's possessions, inheritance that he had given him. He retrieved that. And then we see, uh, we'll read this quickly in Genesis 14. As he's coming out, he rejects anything from the king of Sodom. And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brings out to him bread and wine. Who's Melchizedek? He was a priest of God, most high, and he blessed Abram. Saying, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gives him a tenth of everything. Okay, we can take that off. So, this is not the first time a tithe was ever given. It's the first time in scripture that a tithe is mentioned. We're not going to talk about the tithe today, but my dad spoke about it last week. If you didn't get it, uh, he spoke about the fact that this was long before the law. Uh, a tithe was given. So, who is this Melchizedek dude? Melchi. Melchi. King Melchi. Let's look at Hebrews because Mel Melchizedek is mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's a very specific reason why he is mentioned in both. Are you interested in what Melchizedek represents? Okay, are you in? Okay, money and his labrake. Lost his cell phone eight and all echoters. Focus, 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 focus. Okay, I should walk around and, and get you. Some people can be so out of it because your mind takes you everywhere. It's not just your mind, it's the enemy trying to distract you from a revelation. My mom gets these t teachings and goes through them over and over till they're in her spirit. And she says to all of you, you can't just hear it once. You've got to get it, and, but at least hear it today, okay? All right. Let's look at Hebrews. And she writes notes, and she goes over with the teachings. So this is now New Testament. It talks about the same deal. Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. Okay, that's the same thing. He met Abram returning from the defeat of the kings. Those are the five kings Abram defeated, and he blessed him. And Abram gives him a tenth of everything. So first, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. This is not my notes. This is Hebrews 7 verse 3. Then also, king of Salem means king of Peace, because Salem is the word from which Shalom comes, king of peace. So we see the king of righteousness being a prince of peace. And he's without father or mother. He's without genealogy. He's without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. Okay, here we see an Old Testament picture and a type coming together with a New Testament revelation of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, prince of peace. Now, what is the kingdom of God made up of? Righteousness. Peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. This is the substance of what the Holy of what the kingdom is made of. Do you see the kingdom represented? Yah is the King of Righteousness and the Prince of Peace, representing what the kingdom is. And he, Melchizedek, is the first king and priest, the first king and priest of a royal order. And this standing of king and priest, I'm going to say it, and you won't understand, and I'll explain it some more again, but I'm going to say it, lest some of you ex understand it now already and get very excited. This king and priest of the royal order, the standing that he holds, Melchizedek, he holds in trust for the New Testament reality where the sons of God will be revealed. 
a standing of king and priest is held by a fleshly type, in the flesh, a type of, held in trust for a New Testament reality for the sons of God to be made manifest. To understand. So, Melchizedek is not the son of God. He's not the son of God. He is like the son of God. That verse 3 tells us very clearly, like the son of God. He reminds us of the son of God, who is the high priest. Christ Jesus. You understand? So he's not Christ Jesus. He's a, high, he's a priest of royal lineage. He's a king and a priest who is like the Son of God, reminding us of the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. That's Jesus. The high priest of the order of Melchizedek. So the Old and New Testament are now tied together and we look back with the wisdom of and the revelation of the New Testament, we look back to understand the Old Testament and what it was talking about. So, early human history, we find a royal priest. Royal. Why royal? Because God is God. And He's the King of all kings. And so sons of God are kingly. And Melchizedek represents royalty as a son of God. Remember I said last week, not all human beings are sons of God by, by virtue of them being human beings. You are son of God because You've been born of the Spirit of God. And yeah, we have a type of a son of God who is royal because God is royal. And he's a son of God. So he's a, a king. And he's kingly. See, we are not born from God in our flesh. I'm saying this over and over because we have to get this. Even if I say it every week, the same thing. We'll come layer upon layer, but we have to understand we are not born from God in our flesh. We are born from God in our spirit. And so we take from God our kingly character. We take from God a royal kingly character. And the first order of kingly rule is to see to the well-being of those subject to our rule. The first responsibility, the first order of kingly rule is to be concerned with the well-being of those who are within the realms of our rule. Those are we responsible for. If we didn't understand rule correctly, if you weren't here with Viceroy and you think rule is domineering over for your own possession, for your own benefit, then we would say we'd have a problem with this term, but those that are under your rule, those who you rule over, of the first order of kingly rule, their well-being is your concern. You rule by serving those who are under your authority or under your responsibility or under your jurisdiction of rule. What does rule represent? Those of you that missed out on the Viceroy series, the rule represents a standard, a measure of heaven the measure of the household that you represent, the household of God. The standard of God is being made manifest through your rule. You are representing in physical, tangible ways the standard of God, the, river, the, 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 the standard of heaven, and the nature and character of your father by ruling. Ruling is not domineering, it is making manifest that standard. Serving those under your jurisdiction, under your authority, with kingly rule. So fathers, rule your household well. What does that mean? Have your children do everything that you don't want to do? Make them fluid lapper and do whatever you want because there's no consequences because you rule the, rule the roost? 
That's an unredeemed understanding of rule. A kingly kingdom understanding of rule is you serving your family with the standard of heaven. They are your first priority of saying, how do I manifest, make manifest the nature and character of our heavenly father to my family? That's how you rule. So you're making sure that where you're ruling, it's as if God himself was ruling there. The first order of kingly rule is the well-being of those who you rule over. Okay. So, when you become a believer, you immediately take on the characteristic associated with rule and kingliness. When you become a follower of God, when you are born again, when you become a believer, when you're born of the Spirit, you immediately take on the characteristics associated with rule and kingliness. So for instance, let's take a drug dealer. Give me a name of a, of a drug dealer, a good name, not someone you know, just a fictitious name. Mr. White. Mr. White. Yeah. It's racist, my bro. Okay, call him Whitey, eh? Okay. So Whitey is a drug dealer. Okay? How does he live? He lives in constant suspicion of those around him. He's fearful that people will take his stuff, even those who are working in his own business. He's fearful that they're going to take his product, that they're going to do him in, that they're going to get other clients that are his clients. He's fearful that people are going to kill him, steal from him, and he lives in fear and suspicion. Whitey is guarded. He's defensive. And he's ready to protect himself at every time. You, you, can't, even, you can't even walk past him in the street. He's, he's safe. <laughs> you know Whitey. And Whitey thinks nothing of stealing from others or even killing. Because that's his nature. Fearful, suspicious, defensive, Protective, that's Whitey. When Whitey becomes a believer, something incredible, that's French for incredible, <laughs> happens. Something incredible happens. Whitey's nature changes. How Whitey views others changes. Immediately, he takes on royal characteristics. He takes on a royal character. And some of these characteristics that's revealed in how the first order of kingly rule is that you're concerned for the well-being of others, Whitey tries to lead others, even his enemies, even those who are stealing from him. Hey, he tries to lead them to the Lord. Why? Because inherent in the fact that he's received a new nature, he looks at people differently. That's not his human nature. His human nature was suspicious, it was fearful, it was guarded. Where did he get it from? He got it from Whitey Senior. That's human nature. But white is changed in his nature. Immediately, even at the expense of his own peril, even putting himself in harm's way, he now pursues leaving others to the Lord. His outlook changes. Why? Because his nature changed. Immediately, his nature changed. 
he took on a kingly character. And as a king and a priest, even at personal risk to himself, he will try to lead others to righteousness and peace. You see the priestly role of Melchizedek, king of righteousness, prince of peace. This is what Whitey does. He takes on a royal priesthood character, and he wants to lead the previous enemy of his to righteousness and peace. And the change of him in him is noticeable immediately. He thinks differently of others. Why? He's a royal priest. He's part of a royal priesthood. So in the picture, you, you see in your mind, Abram coming, Melchizedek as a king priest coming to serve him, bread and wine. He has this guy without mother and father, without genealogy, without uh, uh, beginning of days or end of life. You see him serving Abram. Now the priest represents an attitude of service. The priest represents an attitude of service. Abram represents the heirs. And the priest serves the heirs. The priest serves the sons of God. He's concerned with the well-being of others. And this character of service is represented in the priesthood of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 says he has no beginning of days. He has no end of life. He has no mother, no father, no genealogy. Why? What does that mean? That is a description or a definition of what an eternal creature in time and space is defined by. An eternal creature. Remember, we are not born after the flesh. We are born in God by the Spirit. And a definition of eternal creature, we don't have the beginning of days, we don't have an end of life. Eternal creatures. So when you are born again, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says that if you're in Christ, a new creature is born. That old man is gone, the new is here. You see, no matter your past, no matter your fleshly genealogy, no matter your history, no matter what your parents were, no matter anything about your past, when he breathes his spirit, we sang it, when he breathes his spirit into you, he brings new life to your spirit. And your spirit is born again, and change occurs in your nature. That self-serving nature, that self-preserving nature, is now changed to serving others. You might look the same. Like, I mean... That face, God didn't give it to you. Your parents gave it to you. You can trace the DNA there, okay? Some of us are more fortunate than others. <laughs> Scripture specifically says God doesn't look on the outside. <laughs> He's really not interested in, in, in what you think how, how good looking you are, but you, you might look the same, but let me tell you, everything about you is different. Everything about your nature is different, because your natural parents are not the source from which you are born again. You're born again of the Spirit. Let's look at that. I mean, Scripture's full of it. John 3, verse 5 and 6, you can look at that. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Because flesh gives birth to flesh. But the Spirit 
gives birth to spirit. So Melchizedek is a type of one born of God, and Scripture says he has no parents. He has no mother. He has no father. He has nothing. Now, I'm not going to take a long time. Just look, let's look at Romans 8, verse 8 to 10. It's so beautiful. You must read the Bible. It is so cool. You read, you read Romans 6, 7, 8. Your eyes, you go to, your mind can be blown. I'm only going to give you a few verses. Go and blow your mind. Can you do that? Do yourself a favor. Go and blow your mind. Because Whitey's not selling the drugs anymore. Go and blow your mind on Romans. Those who are in the realm of the flesh can't please God. But you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. I'm going to say that again. Those in the realm of flesh can't please God. But you, however, are not in the realm of flesh. But you are in the realm of the Spirit. These are not my notes. This is the passage of Scripture that we're reading. If indeed the Spirit of God breathed His essence into you, breathed His nature and character into you, breathed His life into you, you are in the realm of the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, then you don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is still the same body, we folded up the package, the tent of our brother last week. His body packed up, was clear, was finished. But that's not very easy. He's not in the realm of the flesh. He's born in the realm of the spirit. And the spirit, the body is subject to death. But the spirit gives life because of righteousness. Okay. So, in truth, you have no father, you have no mother, you have no genealogy. Because you are not born according to the flesh. You are a spirit being. Remember, we defined a spirit being. How would you define an eternal being here in time and space? Without beginning of days, without end of life, no mother, no father, no genealogy, because you're not that. You're born in the realm of the the spirit. That's not who you are. So in truth, when the enemy comes to attack you concerning your past, and wants to accuse you concerning your past, you can rightly say to the enemy, you have the wrong person. That person who could be rightfully accused of those things is dead. Now with adoption, there are basic rules of adoption. One of two things. For you to be able to be adopted, either your parents must give up their right to you as parents. They must willfully give up their right for you. You cannot be adopted if your parents lay claim to you. What's for Sunday? Or you can be adopted in the event of death. So they either give up their right or they naturally lose their right because of death. There is no more. So, if you are not born again, if you are not born of the Spirit, Adam will not give up his rights to your identity according to the flesh. You are identified according to the flesh in Adam Unless you are born again. But when you are born again, born of the Spirit, it requires Adam to give up his rights to identify you according to the flesh, which makes you now eligible for adoption because you have died. Romans 6. Let's read Romans 6 from verse 3 quickly. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Remember last week I said how you become a son is through marriage. You are married to Christ and all that is his, including sonship, is yours. You were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him 
through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Verse 5. Verse 5. I'm sure it is there. Did we do 5? Yes. For if we have not, if we have been united with him in death like he's, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like he's. For we know that our old self, our fleshly identity in Adam, was crucified so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to that sinful fleshly nature because anyone who has died has been set free from that sin nature. So God's Spirit breathes into you new life. And when His Spirit breathes new life into you, a new creature comes forth in the earth. I'll say it again. When we sang that song, but some of you were so just singing the words. But when His Spirit breathes life, into you. A new creature, a new creation comes forth in the earth. A son is born. And that son is without genealogy. Because that creature never previously existed. He's without beginning. And he has no end of life. Shall we read a few scriptures? John 3 verse 5 and 6. Oeh, daar is lekker goed as jylle moet net bykie gaan lees wat staan. John 3 verse 5 and 6 is it there. Unless, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. John 11, 25 and 26 says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though their flesh dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. No end of life. Do you believe this? No end of life. Do you see how Melchizedek is the type of the sons of God and he holds this position of king priest, a kingly priest, one who serves as a priest, as royal nature and serves in the priest, he in the flesh holds this position in trust for the sons of God. Now, some of you don't know what that means. Let me explain. It's a legal term, in trust. So someone, let's say a father wants his children to inherit a possession. But the children are not read, yet ready for it, either by age or whatever. The father creates a trust and appoints a trustee who holds that inheritance or that possession in a trust until such time that the children come to a maturity and are able to receive that inheritance, and that person is called the beneficiary. We are the beneficiaries. And all that Malki is doing is he's holding in trust this position of king and priest, which is given by the father for his sons, for the sons of God. He's holding this in the flesh, in a trust, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God to come to maturity and come into the inheritance to be the kings and priests. Those of us who have no beginning of days, those of us who have no end of life, those of us who are not born according to the flesh, we do not have a father and a mother who do not have a genealogy because we're born of the Spirit. We were new creations that were born the day you were born of the Spirit. 
us who are kings of righteousness and princes of peace, who serve the heirs of God with bread and wine. Now, someone asked me today, are we going to deal with that, 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 that lost brother? This, the, the sonship issue where there's, where there's uh, the, the lost brother that spent his life on prodigal living and returned and the older brother wasn't concerned about him. That older brother does not know sonship, nor does he function as a king and a priest because... Melchizedek served, served, served Abram, who represents the heirs, the sons of God. Melchizedek serves them with bread and wine. What does bread and wine represent? The body of Christ. And so we who are kings and priests are not saying, I'm looking for position. My first order of business of kingly rule as a king and priest is the welfare of those we serve. It is to serve the body of Christ to those who God has created to be heirs, to be the sons of God. Our desire is to bring them in to the kingdom of righteousness and into the kingdom of peace. As kings of righteousness and princes of peace, we bring them into that kingdom. That's our order of business. That's why we are kings and priests. A royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Born from above. Not born from the flesh. That's our nature. Filled with the Spirit of God, by which we cry out now, Abba, Father. Adopted into the Father. Romans 8, verse 14 and 15. Let's just read this one more time. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. We'll talk about that maybe next week a little bit more. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship by which we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. You see, God was so intent on bringing about sons into the earth. If you don't get this, please, I'm going to say this over and over again. God's purpose in creating mankind was to create a race called the sons of God. He's, he's committed to that by an oath to himself. He will make it happen no matter what. And he set types and shadows that will remind us of who we are and what His purposes are. I want to tell you, when God brings forth sons of God in the earth, then the eternal purposes of God are fulfilled. If, if, you, if, if you just knew how interested God was in you, if you just knew how committed God was in you. If you can get over your bad experiences with your daddy or the daddy you never had, you're not born according to the flesh. You don't even have a mother and a father and a genealogy. If you're born in the spirit, that old guy, you might look the same, but there's a different nature. You're not guarded. You're not protecting yourself. You're not just trying to survive. You're not looking for the approval of men. You are born of the spirit. You have a different nature and a different character. Hey, is by Islam. When you start seeing how God orchestrated this, how He hid this from the enemy, how it's been His intention all along to bring forth sonships, you will get over the lie of the enemy that He's brought to you to cause you to be an orphan. You start living as a king and a priest. A king because you're a son of God, you understand royalty. Priesthood because you're serving the others, serving the sons of God, serving the heirs of God with the body of Christ. Bringing them into righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Bringing them into the kingdom because your nature's changed. Your nature's changed. 
not you change your nature. He breathed a different nature in you. You were born of a different stock. You came from the Spirit of God. Breathe His nature into you. Now we have to learn to live by His Spirit. Live with that nature. And not keep going back to the death, to the flesh, and living according to that by the renewing of our mind so we can understand it. I want us, we did this last week, and I'm, I'm going to do it again. I want you just to turn just to one or two people, just two or three in a little group. Everyone hears different things. As my brother said, everyone's soil of their heart is different. Different acidity prepared for different seeds. And some things plant well in certain soil and some things in other soil. Depending what God has prepared your heart with, you've heard different things. Different things have become real to you. Different things stood out. I want you just to share with someone, just, just with one or two. Just turn to each other and share what you heard. What really stuck out to you? What was so real to you? What came alive to you? What did you hear? Just turn to someone and just share with them. Don't have to share the whole rest of the message. If you shared already, that's fine. But just share with someone what you heard. What did you, what stood out for you? Just that one thing. Some made groups of five or six, and that's why they're taking longer. What I want you to do is share with each other how, in what way, can you serve someone as a king and a priest, as a royal priest, in what way can you serve someone else with the body of Christ, with the bread and wine? In what way can you start ruling well, making known the nature and the character of your father by how you're serving someone else? Have you got it? Go and share with each other. In what way can you serve others as a king and a priest? Last one. Is there someone that the Holy Spirit drops in your spirit that you can share with this week? This thing that's become real to you, is there a way that you could just drop the seed into someone else's life? Just plant that seed without Bible punching them. Maybe just say, I learned something about God this week. Someone you could just share with about God's purposes for us. Just mention it to the person. Who's that person? How can you maybe share it with someone? Maybe you're continuing from a conversation you had last week. Can we pray together? Father, we thank you. We thank you for your persistent determination and commitment to produce sons in the earth. And we thank you, Lord, that every single one of us in this room have been privileged to understand the, privilege, the purposes of God. We're no longer in the dark. We won't be lied to by the enemy concerning our identity or our worth or your purpose for us. But we know, Father, your purposes for us are higher than we could have thought or imagined. And it's all got to do with us being sons of God. That even in the flesh, the enemy meant for harm, to kill, steal, and destroy. But Father, you breathed your spirit into us, caused us to be formed new creatures in the earth. And Father, you also have given us full right to sonship. You've placed on us the anointing of priests, of royal priesthood who are to serve others with the body of Christ, bringing them into your kingdom, bringing them into righteousness and peace, and showing them what our Father's purposes are for their lives. Cause us to be constantly aware of our inheritance that you have in us. 
thank you, Lord God, that we can now take from the trust that Melchizedek held and we can appropriate it to our lives and we can become full beneficiaries of the promise that you made to yourself to bring us into sonship. Father, may you be glorified through us, your sons, in the earth. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm.